So it's my pleasure to be here uh, and speaking this morning. Uh, I'm a paediatrician. Uh, I always imagined I'd be a GP and somehow I ended up being a paediatrician, but I think, I think my heart still lies somewhere in that space between. I confirm I do not have any conflicts of interest to declare. And I have three objectives for the presentation today. At the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe child health in New Zealand relative to other developed countries, recognise why our new child cohort study, Growing Up in New Zealand, can help to improve child health in New Zealand, and use examples from growing up in New Zealand to show that new approaches are needed to improve child health in New Zealand. So let's start with the first one. Describe child health in New Zealand relative to other developed countries. This uh, report by the OECD in 2009 tried to create an uh, indicator of child health that could be used to compare different countries in the OECD. And they used these pretty basic measures maternal well-being, housing and environment, educational well-being, a number of child well-being indicators, uh, low birth weight, infant mortality, breastfeeding and immunisation rates, physical activity, and then mortality rates and suicide rates, risk behaviours and quality of school life. And they tried to gather that data on countries. The report card for New Zealand, insufficient information to be included in the overall assessment. Maternal well-being, New Zealand was below average and behind Australia, just ahead of the UK and the USA. A relatively large percentage of our children living in poverty. Second to lowest immunisation rates at two years of age, although that has since improved. Highest rates of child deaths from accidents and injuries. And in 2009, we ranked 29th out of 30 OECD countries for overall child health and safety, based upon these very basic measures. And there we are on the graph, way down the bottom, right next to the United States, and two standard deviations below the norm, which is far enough away that you can't just say, uh, this is a chance finding. Okay, so things aren't perfect, but are we at least on the right track? Let's start with infectious diseases. This slide here compares hospital admission rates for lower respiratory tract infections, skin and soft tissue infections, and gastrointestinal infections. 1989 to 93 in red, and then more recent data, 2004 to 2008 in blue. As you can see, in all three of those main infection group categories, we've had an increase in our hospital admission rate. And this has been seen not only in children, but in adults also. That burden is not equally shared across the population. If we looked at European children, we actually see a trend for potentially infectious diseases admissions decreasing but not so for Māori and Pacific, and the gap between European and Māori and Pacific has increased over this time period. Are we alone? Is it just us? Here's uh, similar data just published a couple of weeks ago from the United States reporting their infectious disease hospitalizations from 2000 to 2012 for children less than 20 years of age, going down. If we look at specifics, bronchiolitis and pneumonia, two very common problems in early childhood, hospital admission rates in New Zealand that are two to three times higher than those in England or the United States. This uh, is a graph from a publication from the United States on skin and soft tissue infections, which they released uh, because of their concern that these hospital admission rates were increasing. Let's see if we can pin the, news, 
the New Zealand tail on the American donkey. Whoops. <laughs> it just seems to come up everywhere. So we'll start with all children. There's the American rate in 2000. There's the New Zealand rate in 2000. All children in 2007. American rate you see, New Zealand rate there. If we concentrate on the infants, the American rate shown there in 2007, the New Zealand rate almost off the top of the, of the uh, slide. So it starts really early. Let's move on to non-communicable diseases. New Zealand uh, does not rate poorly from a global obesity perspective. We're the fourth fattest country in the world after the United States, Mexico, and Australia. The problem, again, starts early. For children aged 2 to 14 years, 11% of these children in New Zealand are obese, based upon the standards we use for adults. 85,000 children. And again, it starts very early. By two to four years of age, we've got almost 10% of our child population being obese, and then it just gradually increases from there onwards. Again, we have big differences between population subgroups, with uh, the, the rate of obesity being higher for Māori, higher for Pacific, lower for Asian, higher for those living in most deprived compared to least deprived households. We have this wonderful combination of macronutrient excess and micronutrient deficiency. Our rate of iron deficiency in early childhood, approximately twice that of Australia, Europe and the United States. Vitamin D deficiency, uh, with, with that being defined by a level so low that the child's at risk of rickets, being several times higher in New Zealand than in the United States. Let's move on to atopic diseases. These are diseases that are becoming an increasing problem. Food allergy in particular is an issue that has really become an issue of this generation. Uh, we all probably remember being at school and it not being an issue, whereas now our children are at school and there's ch children in every class who have an allergy that requires the class to change its behaviour. This slide here shows the, the uh, dramatic increase in an anaphylaxis presentations to hospital in the United States over the last decade. Similar data from uh, Australia showing a rapid increase in, in the hospital admissions for anaphylaxis with most of these caused by food, with this being particularly noticeable in the youngest children. Contemporary data from New Zealand that we've just collected showing hospital presentations for food, anaphylactic and allergic reactions in New Zealand children a very similar pattern. So this is a, a global phenomenon that's affecting New Zealand as well as many other countries. Let's look now at non-communicable diseases that, that occur as a result of a prior communicable disease. Bronchiectasis, a really common problem in our young children, presenting often by even as young as age five, and the only country with comparable data is Finland, and our rate is approximately seven times higher than theirs, and I'm sure we only pick the tip of the iceberg. Rheumatic heart disease in children of, of uh, primary school age. Rates in New Zealand comparable to, the, to that uh, in, a, in a Maori and Pacific population to what's seen in Australian Aboriginals, a little bit lower than what's seen in Sub-Saharan Africa, and just a whole spectrum higher than what's seen in most developed countries. Are we alone? No, but I think we're in the least safe orbit. So the first objective of the presentation was to describe child health in New Zealand relative to other developed countries. And to summarise that, we're 29th out of 30 OECD countries for overall child health and safety. We have an increasing infectious disease burden that's several times higher and countries we usually like to compare ourselves to with large differences between population subgroups. 
and we have a large and increasing non-communicable disease burden. Obesity, atopic disease, post-infectious non-communicable disease, and again, large differences between population subgroups. So the second objective was to uh, recognise why our new child cohort study, Growing Up in New Zealand, can help to improve child health in New Zealand. So Growing Up in New Zealand is a study that started 12 years ago, initiated by the Ministry of Social Development, uh, and, and it was designed to establish a new longitudinal study of New Zealand children and families. To do this requires data from the diversity of New Zealand children. So we had some essential design features to this study. We wanted to start before birth, we wanted to enrol a diverse sample, and we wanted to include partners. And we wanted the study to be big enough to answer the, main quest the questions for the main population subgroups in New Zealand. So growing up in New Zealand is a longitudinal study tracking the development of around 7,000 New Zealand children from before birth until they are young adults. The study has enrolled its sample from this region of the North Island defined by the Auckland Counties Manukau and Waikato District Health Boards, basically a region between the Waitamata Harbour and Lake Taupo. This region was chosen because a third of New Zealand births occur in this region, it's got a diverse sample, and it would enable us to get a, a, a good diversity of the population. The sample that we enrolled is broadly generalisable to all New Zealand births. We enrolled 11% of the babies born in New Zealand over the recruitment period. So it's a big sample. We used multiple recruitment strategies. Uh, we enrolled 6,822 pregnant women, 4,401 of their partners, and the 6,853 children that were born uh, define the child cohort. This shows the month of enrolment, and as you can see, it spanned all, all four seasons of the year. Now, cohort studies are only good if you can keep people enrolled in them. If you have lots dropping out, then they become biased and, and, more, and less useful. So we've tracked our recruitment and retention rates very closely and have managed to keep families engaged in the study during the early years of the study, which is when most of the families have difficulty engaging with such projects. And having just completed the last preschool phase when the children were four and a half years of age, we had 90% of the cohort children for whom that phase was completed. With only 149 participants having opted out of the study, another 142 lost to follow up for now, and the remainder who didn't complete just asked if they could skip this data collection wave. So cohort studies allow you to look at a wide range of influences. With this study having been set up by the Ministry of Social Development, it was always meant to have a very broad perspective. So we'll be looking at the contribution of fathers, mothers, the family, what happens during pregnancy, the effect of genes and, and of gene expression, the effect of nutrition, of housing, and of broader societal influences. And we look how these impact upon the child, and we look at how they impact upon the child as the child grows up. We collect information by face-to-face -face interviews with the mum and the partner, and then as, as the child gets older with the child, which as you can see, we've done during pregnancy at nine months, two years, and four and a half years of age then with some telephone interviews in between, and then with linkage to data such as the perinatal records and the National Immunisation Register, and then the collection of biological samples so we can look at things such as the bacteria living on these children and, uh, and the children's uh, genetic uh, profiles. So we were successful in enrolling a diverse sample. This slide here shows the ethnicity of the enrolled mothers and partners. Almost 20% of the mothers and partners identified with more than one ethnic group. And one third of the children have at least one parent born overseas. New Zealand is an, a diverse and an increasingly diverse country. 
we enrolled a sample that reflected the socioeconomic spectrum of the New Zealand population. This slide here shows the proportion of the children living in households of different deprivation deciles, uh, with growing up in New Zealand shown in light blue and New Zealand shown in dark blue. Very comparable. So the second objective of this presentation was to enable you to recognise why our new child cohort study, Growing Up in New Zealand, can help to improve child health in New Zealand. The Growing Up in New Zealand study is a cohort of children from before their birth that's broadly generalisable to the birth cohort of New Zealand, explicitly designed to have adequate explanatory power for the main ethnic subgroups, inclusion of partners for 65% of the enrolled women, and 90% retention at age five years. So the third objective of my presentation is to use examples from growing up in New Zealand to show that new approaches are needed to improve child health in New Zealand. And I'm going to do that looking back and using the framework of the essential design features start before birth, enrol a diverse sample, include the partners. So let's look at some pregnancy things. This slide here is going to show you some data looking at the adherence to the recommended number of daily servings of each of the four main food groups, fruit and vegetables, bread and cereals, meat and meat products, and dairy. This slide here shows the percentage of pregnant women who meet the recommendations for each food group. About 25% meet the recommendations for vegetables and fruit, about a little bit more for bread and cereals, over half for milk and milk products, and about 25% for meat and eggs. This next slide shows the proportion who meet none, one, two, three, or all four food group recommendations. As you can see, 3% of the pregnant women met all four food group recommendations just an enormous disconnect between what is practice and what is policy. If we look at folate consumption, voluntary folate, folic acid supplementation is taken in a manner that could prevent a neural tube defect by 39% of pregnant women in New Zealand. It's not great. And this slide here shows the proportion of women by ethnicity and by household deprivation who are taking folic acid supplements before pregnancy in a manner that would prevent them from having a baby affected by a neural tube defect. Enormous differences by ethnicity, enormous differences by household deprivation. Both of these differences would be eliminated if we had fortification of our flour with folate. Moving to a slightly more positive note, We've looked in the study at what things can be done during pregnancy that might make a difference to birth outcomes. And here's one example where we've looked at physical activity during pregnancy and determined the risk of caesarean section. We think this is an important area. 24% of the cohort children were born by caesarean section, which seems an enormously high proportion to me. And as you can see, if women were able to maintain moderate or vigorous physical activity, during the second and third trimesters of their pregnancy, they reduced their risk of having a delivery by caesarean section uh, by about 25%. Breastfeeding intentions versus breastfeeding reality. When the women were pregnant, 62% of them intended to breastfeed for greater than six months. When we asked them that when the children were nine months old, we found that less than 10% of the infants were exclusively breastfed to six months. Immunisation intentions by household deprivation. During pregnancy, we asked the woman, did they intend to fully immunise their child? Women living in the most deprived households, the largest, had the highest proportion saying they intended to fully immunise their child. We looked at immunizations received by the children during infancy, and we found that by five months of age, children living in the most deprived households had the lowest odds of being immunized. 
So despite their best intentions, their children are not being immunised. Health and well-being of the children at age two years. 86% were described by the parents as having excellent or very good health. On average, they slept for 10 and a half hours, with 12% having less than the recommended 11 hours of sleep per night, and 5% having more than the recommended 14 hours of sleep. Ten percent had been told by their doctor that their child had an allergy by age two years. And twenty percent had had at least one hospital admission. This slide here shows the risk factors for peanut allergy presenting by age two years in the cohort. As you can see, the risk is increased for boys. The risk is increased dramatically for children who've, who have eczema. The risk varies by uh, ethnicity being higher for children of Asian ethnicity. The risk varies by maternal education being lower for children whose mothers are less educated. On, on this slide I show the risk factors for hospital admission with an infectious disease in the first year of life. The, all of these factors increase the risk of hospital admission. Maternal smoking, daycare attendance, deprived household, maternal experience of healthcare racism, exclusive breastfeeding for less than four months, low birth weight, Pacific ethnicity and Maori ethnicity. If we look within the ethnic groups who have the greatest infectious disease burden, we find that there are some factors that are common to both groups. Paternal smoking is a risk factor both for Maori and for Pacific but we find there are some risk factors that are specific to ethnic groups. Deprived household is an issue for Māori infants. Maternal experience of healthcare racism is an issue for Pacific infants of Pacific mums, and delayed immunisation is a specific issue for Pacific infants. On this slide, I show the proportion of the cohort children who had received an antibiotic prescription by a month of their life. As you can see, there's a remarkable seasonal variation from year to year and a very high proportion of the children receiving antibiotics. The antibiotic prescribing that occurs to these children is driven primarily by their acute respiratory infection primary care visits. Is there a relationship between antibiotic exposure and obesity? The slide on the left shows the uh, median uh, number of courses of antibiotics by ethnic group, and as you can see, it is higher for Māori and higher for Pacific. The slide on the right shows the proportion of children with obesity. As you can see, it's higher for Māori, higher for Pacific. We give antibiotics to uh, our young uh, piglets to make them fatter. It's, it's a strategy that's been known in the agricultural industry for 50 or 60 years. I can't help wondering if it's, it is one of the contributors to our obesity problem that begins so early in life. Partners' participation in child immunisation. We're, we're brave but sensitive souls. <laughs> we know very little about the decisions partners make if their immunisation decisions agree with those of the mother if their decisions affect the timeliness of their child's immunisations. This slide here compares the immunisation decisions of the mums and the partners. As you can see, a, a larger proportion of the partners, 22% versus 13% for the mums, remain undecided during pregnancy about their child's immunisations. And a slightly smaller proportion of those who have decided have decided upon full immunisation. There's only moderate agreement between mums and their partners on their immunisation decisions. I wonder how many of them actually have the conversation. If we look at partner immunisation decision making and the odds of the infant being immunised on time, and we adjust that for the decisions made by the mum and for all the partner demographics that we can think of, we see that the odds of being immunised on time 
are significantly increased if the partner is decided versus undecided and are, are increased further if the partner is decided on full immunisation. So they do have an important role. I think we need a celebrity immunisation goalmaker. I could see someone advertising at halftime on the rugby perhaps. So the third objective was to use examples from growing up in New Zealand to show that new approaches are needed to improve child health in New Zealand. There's a current disconnect between pregnancy nutrition policy and pregnancy nutrition reality. I think we need to focus on pregnancy health behaviours that can improve pregnancy outcomes. Current policy does not address the needs of the diversity of New Zealand's population. We need to identify issues of specific relevance to the population groups with the largest disease burden. Parents currently cannot achieve their own parenting plans and expectations. We need a greater emphasis on helping the dads be better dads as well as the mums be better mums. The last question we asked of the parents at the antenatal interview was for them to give us one or two sentences about the hopes, dreams and expectations they have for their baby. Here are some of their answers. I hope she has a better childhood than I had and enjoys what she wants to when she grows up. I also hope she's financially secure. To grow up with the belief in itself that we are all different and it's okay to be who we are. To be brought up in a safe community like this, that was the reason we moved. He should grow up feeling loved, nurtured, encouraged and inspired by an extended network of family and friends. So just to go over things again, oh, and that, that's not my bike. <laughs> the objectives were to enable you to be able to describe child health in New Zealand relative to other developed countries, to recognise why our new child cohort study, Growing Up in New Zealand, can help to improve child health in New Zealand, and to use examples from Growing Up in New Zealand to show that new approaches are needed to improve child health in New Zealand. We're 29th out of 30 OECD countries for overall child health and safety. We have an increasing infectious disease burden. We have a large and increasing non-communicable disease burden. We've enrolled a cohort of children from before their birth. It's been explicitly designed to have adequate explanatory power for the main ethnic subgroups. We've included partners for two thirds of the pregnant woman and we've got excellent retention throughout the preschool years. There's currently a disconnect between pregnancy nutrition policy and pregnancy nutrition reality. Current policy does not address the needs of the diversity of New Zealand's population. Parents currently cannot achieve their own parenting plans and expectations. And greater emphasis is needed on helping the dads be better dads as well as the mums be better mums. I think growing up in New Zealand is like a bottomless cup. Some will drink from this bottomless cup of knowledge. Others will just gargle. But whether you're a gargler or a drinker, I think growing up in New Zealand has something for you. I just want to end by acknowledging all the, all the participants and their families, everyone who works in the Growing Up in New Zealand team, uh, all the organisations that have made it possible, and those that have provided funding for the project. Thank you very much. Have we got the, mic got the microphone, Selena, for Kittis to take it on? Um, you can see why uh, Cameron won prizes medical students. They would go away uh, completely understanding what you said. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. Uh, one of the things I was going to tell you about, one of our web quiz and podcasts this year are going to be called Nutrition Made Easy. And my explicit instruction to nutritionists is no numbers. I don't want to see 30% of my calories due to fat because I have no idea how many percentage of calories due to fat. So we're going to actually have pictures of plates and proportions. And I guess my 
criticism of nutrition policies that they're full of numbers. You know, I, I agree 10 with you. percent saturated fat. I mean, what the hell is that? I agree with you, Bruce. And I think mm. some countries have taken a completely different approach. Uh, if I give you an example, Brazil did a survey of the whole country's nutrition. They identified the 20 percent of the population with the best nutrition and said, well, let's see if we can find out what they're doing and apply that to the whole country. And the things that they found out that were most important were the family preparing the meal together, the family eating the meal together, uh, and using locally grown products. Those were the three key, key things that they now emphasise in their uh, nutrition policy. The, 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 the destruction of the social context of eating and, and, and the way that we've been tricked into thinking that it's great that we can eat any time anywhere, no matter what we're doing, uh, and, and, and that breakdown of the, of the essential social context that the, that the meal together provides is, I think, one of the biggest mistakes we've probably made in, in the last generation. So the question down there now, is the microphone, we've got a mobile a microphone, microphone there. coming around. Um, if Nikki Turner is still here, whether she'd like to make a comment on, is Nikki here still, is she? Yeah, whether Nikki would like to make a comment about immunisation at some point, just about, because I think the figures have improved dramatically, haven't they? We're doing well. So Nikki's up the back there. Where's Kittis? Okay. So the, so the question was, whether, what is the rate of neural tube defects in New Zealand relative to countries that have uh, mandatory fortification of their food? The rates in New Zealand are, are, are higher. They're roughly twice as high. And there's good data showing that if you implement mandatory fortification, rates of neural tube defects decrease. And good information from many other countries showing exactly the same phenomenon that we see in New Zealand. The families that are most likely to have a child with a neural tube defect are the families who have the least resources available to them to care for a child with, with such a disabling condition. Got Nikki Turner up in the audience there. Uh, thank you, Bruce, I think. Um, just firstly, thank you to Cameron. I thought that was an extraordinary presentation and a lot of rich material. But, I mean, the thing about immunisation, I think, is it's actually a good story for New Zealand. So it's nice to have some positive stories. And New Zealand's improved its immunisation coverage dramatically over the last 15 to 20 years. And we're now at 94% um, fully immunised at the age of nine months. Cameron's pointed out we still have some equity gaps, particularly for Māori children and children from deprived backgrounds and getting their vaccines on time. But what we've learnt is that systems made a difference. And what we particularly learnt is primary care general practice systems did it and did it effectively and well. And when I started in this game, people would say general practice cannot do this. Well, I think the extraordinary story is general practice can do it by applying systems effectively and well, giving ourselves targets and feedback loops um, educating ourselves well, extraordinary practice nurses, and believing we can make a difference. And, and New Zealand is now leading the world, I think, in what general practice can do, and particularly closing equity gaps in a way we never thought we could. So this is a fantastic story for New Zealand, and certainly the rest of the world has been impressed with New Zealand's general practice ability to do this. And I believe we can do it in other areas in child health if we apply a similar model. So thanks, Bruce. Congratulations. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Nikki, and I think it's an excellent example of using information gathered in New Zealand to understand how to do it better in New Zealand because we've got a healthcare system like any country that's unique and, and we need to understand it well in order to improve how it works. And I think the immunisation register is extraordinary. I think you were part of getting that going. I mean, you can just check, you know, it doesn't have to, we have patients coming and going, but I can actually find out for each of them uh, what their immunisation status, and I'm sure you find that fantastic. A question over there? Yeah, Bruce. Uh, what do you think of the Health Minister's response to the sugar tax? And have you got 20 uh, research papers you can send them? <laughs> I think we are going to need to take an approach to food that's similar to what's been successful for tobacco. Is he right to discount no research? Because uh, he seemed pretty emphatic. 
Uh, no, I don't think he's right to discount there's no, no research. I think, um, you know, sh sugar is certainly one of, of the factors. I, I, I think there are, there are broader factors, though. I think um, the issues around how, how, you know, the basic issues I described that have driven the Brazilian guidelines, I think, are things that we need to address here. Uh, I, I think if we just concentrate on the, on the content of the food, that won't be sufficient. That's, that's music to my ears, Cameron. So we're going to keep no, no numbers in the, in, the, uh, in, the guy, in the nutrition products that we're going to be producing out of uh, Goodfellow, and they'll be sugar-free. Um, so I'd just like to, to thank Cameron. Uh, at long last, uh, my, one of my lifetime goals I can tick off, because I've, I've heard Cameron Grant speak, and uh, we'll certainly be getting you back uh, in future years for sessions. Thank you. And, um, Thank you very I'd like much. to join me in thanking Cameron for talking. Thank you. That was fantastic. That was great.